CNBC. Uh, Monsieur Trichet, if I read you right, the economy is slowing faster than you anticipated. Inflationary pressures are easing, albeit not enough. Monetary growth is also easing maybe even more than stated because of the substitution effect into the short term end of the market and the markets are deteriorating. What in this present scenario is therefore stopping you from cutting rates? You have said uh, that uh, we, our judgment is indeed that uh, we are observing a slowing down of the European economy, the Eurozone economy, and uh, I said that this contributed to alleviate somewhat the upside risks for price stability. They have not disappeared. Uh, we have, uh, in particular, what we are observing in the front of the cost pressure. I mentioned what we are observing in the unit labor cost, and I, I, as you could see, I was very clear in the message uh, for social partners and all price setters not to let second round effects uh, materialize. So our uh, conclusion was that uh, uh, we remain very uh, uh, observing uh, all the evolutions and uh, we monitor uh, all what is happening with great care. Thank you very much. Sir. Christian Fitz with uh, Bloomberg News. Um, so was today's decision on animus and did you discuss the option to lower interest rates today? And is this an option at all for you? And uh, the second question is, uh, did you discuss your recent projections on economic growth? And if so, what was the outcome? And do you still consider to see um, uh, a um, are you confident to see, uh, you, you talked about recovery in 2009, do you, do you still um, expect that against the turmoil? Do you see growing upside risks to this scenario? And did you get an update on the projections, on the growth projections and the others? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, as regards uh, the first question, we were unanimous to take our decision. We have examined two options. One letting interest rates unchanged, another one decreasing interest rates. Our conclusion, our unanimous conclusion, was that uh, we uh, uh, were right in uh, maintaining interest rates as they are, but we examined the two options. Uh, I would say uh, that we are in a situation of exceptionally high level of uncertainty, as I have said several times, on behalf of the Governing Council. And uh, I have to say also that, as always, we are totally free to do any time what would be necessary to, deserve, to, to uh, sub be sure that we can tell our fellow citizens that we will ensure price stability over the medium term. And of course, that depends on our judgment on the balance of risks and the evolution of the situation which influence the balance of risks to price stability. Uh, we uh, have not uh, changed by definition our uh, projections. You know that uh, we uh, have staff projections. They are done under the responsibility of the staff, not under the responsibility of the governing council itself. Uh, and uh, we will have the new projections uh, according to our uh, uh, methodology. So uh, I cannot say that we have any projection. Of course, we are incorporating in our meditation and discussion all the new elements that are coming from the international situation as well as from uh, the situation in Europe. And again, I confirm that our judgment is that we have a weakening of economic activity that is very visible and that the risks for future growth are on the downside. Sir. Hi, um, my name is Carter Doherty with the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times. Um, just to be absolutely clear about this is if we were to write that your baseline scenario has changed perceptibly, would we be wrong? Um, and my second question is, do you have a greater sense now, does the Governing Council have a greater sense now that inflation in 2010 will uh, be at levels consistent with price stability? 
Uh, and the third question is whether you believe uh, the outlook for inflation expectations has improved over the last month. First of all, I would say that, uh, again, we have seen since our last meeting, we have seen changes that I mentioned in the introductory statement on behalf of the Governing Council. It is a judgment of the Governing Council. <laughs> we have both, I would say, the intensification of the financial turbulences, which uh, creates an element of high level of uncertainty that we have to consider, and we have the weakening of, uh, of uh, growth. This permits me to tell you on behalf of the Governing Council that we have seen a reduction in the upside risks for inflation. As I said, in the judgment of the Governing Council, they have diminished, they have not disappeared. And now, as, on, uh, as regards the uh, uh, delivery of price stability in the medium term, in line with our definition, you know that we consider that the mandate we receive from uh, the people of Europe uh, through uh, the treaty is any time to do what is necessary to deliver price stability in the medium term. The medium term, I had already occasion of telling you, is uh, according to the, I would say, uh, time which is necessary for our decision to materialize uh, in uh, the CPI. We, I would say, that 18 months, 20 months, something like that, are the period which is necessary. And I confirm that, according to all we know, we consider that our fellow citizens, the 320 million fellow citizens, can have confidence that we will deliver price stability in line with our definition in this period of 18 months to 20 months, which means the beginning of 2010. Thank you very much for your question indeed. Pardon me? Pardon me? The, the third question was about inflation expectations. About? Inflation expectations and whether they had moderated somewhat over the last month. I'm sorry. I should have responded to this very, very important question. I would say that the solid anchoring of inflation expectations is extremely important for growth and for job creation and for financial stability for reasons that are very simple to understand. If we have an unencouraging of inflation expectations, then medium and long-term market interest rates are going up. Whatever you do on the short-term side of the yield curve, they would go up, and it would be detrimental to growth and job creation. And, of course, it would also considerably unencouraged the real inflation when it comes to so the CPI would be influenced by these expectations. And uh, it is uh, absolutely clear that it is for us crucial, as I said, on behalf of the Governing Council, to solidly anchor expectations. Where do we stand in this respect? I would say that thanks to the decision we took, we have stabilized a ten tendency to have, I would say, higher inflation expectations that had been observed and uh, which uh, uh, we considered uh, uh, a threat, and uh, I would say that uh, as regards the information we extract from financial markets, we have a stabilization of the information we extract from the swap markets. Particularly, we look at the five years, forward five years, and I'm happy to say that uh, we see a good evolution of the inflation expectations when I look at the information we extract from the bond market when we see that we have regained control of inflation expectations in a fashion which is, uh, which is observed by all, I would say, uh, observers. Thank you very much indeed. Madam. Thank you very much, Mr. Trichet. Joellen Perry from the Wall Street Journal. Unless I've missed it, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I have, um, the sentence from last month's statement, the current monetary policy stance will contribute to achieving our objective, is not in this month's statement. Why? Um, secondly, 
you have taken pains in the past um, to be predictable, notwithstanding never pre-committing. Um, are you still committed to being predictable? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, you, the ECB generally has been extremely active in money markets lately, and um, interbank lending rates are not showing signs of responding to so much extra liquidity. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and tell us whether you considered narrowing the band between the marginal lending and the marginal deposit facility as perhaps another way of aiding the market. Could, could you repeat your last question? Uh, did the Governing Council discuss or consider narrowing the band between the marginal lending and the marginal deposit facility? Okay, so for the, for the last question, no, we did not discuss that. Uh, for, um, for, um, for the wording of the introductory statement, again, let me repeat. We are in a situation of exceptionally high level of uncertainty a situation which we never encounter before ourselves since we were set up, a situation which is clearly uh, absolutely exceptional in terms of level of uncertainty. And I have already said, I repeat, as always, uh, we are totally free to do any time what we judge would be necessary to take into account the evolution of the situation in terms of the balance of risks to price stability. I insist we have only one needle in our compass. It is the balance of risk to price stability. Uh, as regards the pre-commitment, as you know, we are never pre-committed. And we do any time what we judge appropriate according to the circumstances. The predictability is to be, to be attributed to the extreme acuteness and lucidity of the observers. Thank you very much indeed. Sir. Jürgen Schaaf with Börsenzeitung. Um, given the two options you discussed, Mr. Trichet, would you say you have a bias? Second question. Um, you talked about the acceleration of union labor costs in the second quarter. Given the slowdown of the economy, how likely do you think is the scenario that this will affect price settings? So how likely is the danger of, let's call it, third round effects in your view? Again, on your first question, <laughs> I will repeat, we are in a situation of exceptionally high level of uncertainty and we are free to do any time what would be necessary. Uh, as regards the labor cost, we have clearly a level of unit labor cost which is in the second quarter reading very high, as I said, uh, much higher than what we had observed uh, one year ago, two years ago. Uh, and that is due to two phenomena. One is that the, the, the slowing down of the economy has counterproductive effects as regards labor productivity. It is what we observe in the uh, European economy in general and in the euro area in particular in period of slowing down uh, in the business cycle. And we have also augmentations, nominal augmentations that are uh, abnormal in our view and explaining the level of uh, unit labor cost that we see. Let me add something. Of course, the Governing Council look at the, looks at the situation at the level of 320 million people in Europe and 15 countries. The situation of the various countries is not the same. And our message of moderation and avoiding second round effects goes, of course, very, very strongly to those that have nominal evolution that are, in our view, very abnormal in terms of uh, uh, wages and salaries augmentations, prices augmentation, and uh, other nominal evolution. So this is uh, something which is very important. We have a general message, but we have also a message for those who are, I would say, uh, uh, moving up in terms of nominal evolution abnormally. Thank you very much for your question. 
Perhaps, uh, if you if you wish, yeah, please, please, ma'am. Toshio Ogata with the Asahi Shinbun Japanese newspaper. Again, the, give, given the diminishing upside risk for price stability and uh, exceptional high level of uncertainty, and also the fact that uh, today governing council discussed the uh, rate cut as uh, one of the two options, will the rate cut at the next meeting be good option? <laughs> I, I give you rendezvous in the next meeting, sir. <laughs> it, it would be a great pleasure that I will tell you what we will have done. Thank you very much for your one question. One, one more question. Yeah, about, it's about the Fortis situation. You are involved in uh, the bailout of the Fortis discussion and uh, with, with the OPM leaders. And it would be difficult to go in details, but uh, let, let Please give us some kind of a glimpse what kind of general recommendation you have made to European leaders at that time. Well, it was not to European leaders in general, of course. It was in particular with my colleague, the Governor of Bank of Belgium, to those who were directly involved in this uh, particular dossier, and uh, I was uh, uh, shipping the message that it was uh, very important in the present circumstances that, uh, of course, Central Bank would do themselves what they have to do. And you know that we have been, I think, exemplary in terms of providing liquidity to the euro area as a whole, in terms of taking appropriate decision. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, you remember that it was the 9th of August that we decided to take uh, important decisions. At the time, some observers were not sure that uh, the situation was uh, uh, that acute. After a very short span of time, everybody recognizes that we had been lucid and right in acting, uh, I would say, uh, without uh, waiting. Uh, and we, we proved that uh, recently, as you know. We have agreed with the Federal Reserve for a swap of $240 billion that would permit to ensure liquidity in dollar, not only in euro, in this side of the Atlantic. So we are doing what we have to do. And of course, in period where it appears that the situation calls for uh, government uh, responsibilities, I confirm that we judge appropriate that government take themselves their responsibilities. I think they did well in the case of the dossier you are mentioning. They did well in the case of other issues, including in this country. And I, I confirm that uh, I think that uh, they did well, the government did well in, in Germany. And, uh, and we will continue to be up to our own responsibilities. The time are demanding, I said. The, situation is exceptionally demanding and uncertain. And of course, in such circumstances, the fact that all private sector as well as public sector, all authorities are up to their responsibilities is extremely important. Thank you very much. Val Fatkins from the Financial Times. Uh, Mr. Trisha, you mentioned the lucidity of observers. Uh, financial markets are now pricing in a 75% chance of a cut in November. Are they showing a uh, acceptable level of lucidity at the moment? Uh, going on beyond that, in September 2001, uh, you cut interest rates by 50 basis points unexpectedly and also in uh, conjunction with the US Federal Reserve. Uh, is that um, a possibility um, that um, we might see something comparable in weeks and months ahead? Uh, and my third question, um, could you just tell us what you think would be a reasonable outcome from this meeting you're attending in uh, Paris on Saturday with um, EU leaders? Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Mr. Hatkins. Uh, first of all, uh, I, will <laughs> I commented uh, that I would attribute our predictability again to the wisdom and lucidity of observers. I will continue to say that, but I never comment, never comment on immediate reaction that uh, <clears throat> the declaration 
of, uh, of uh, the introductory statement could trigger <laughs> in the market. Uh, I uh, uh, consider it would be absolutely uh, inappropriate uh, to comment in real time. It, it, it would be a mirror, uh, a mirror with uh, a dialogue with a mirror, if I may. No. So I uh, trust the lucidity of observers, but I don't comment on their immediate reaction. Uh, as regards uh, the uh, uh, possibility of, uh, of uh, having close cooperation with the other central banks, again, be aware uh, once again of the fact that when we do something, it is on the basis of our assessment on the balance of risks to price stability. And uh, we cannot do otherwise because if we were uh, acting in a different scheme, in a different concept, then we would suggest to those lucid observers and market participants that have been mentioned that uh, they can unincur our inflation expectations because we are introducing other consideration than this solid anchoring of inflation expectation which is based upon our capacity to deliver price stability in the medium term. And if we had this result, it would be a very poor one, including in terms of financial stability. It would introduce volatility in all interest rates, in all market interest rates. It would be very, very bad for, price stabi for financial stability, as well as for price stability, of course. Now, let me, uh, let me say that we have an extraordinary cooperation amongst the central banks. It is true with all central banks. It is true with the Federal Reserve. It is unprecedented to have a swap agreement of $240 billion. It is unprecedented to ensure with a large number of windows, as you know, dollar liquidity on this side of the Atlantic uh, in extremely close cooperation with the Federal Reserve. We cooperate with Bank of England in the same Vain, we cooperate with Bank of Japan and with the other European banks. I mean, I think I have to stress the incredible level of confidence, of mutual confidence that we have and permits this uh, cooperation. Some decisions, we took them in, in a very short span of time across the Atlantic despite the uh, uh, time lag. And uh, I, I think it's extremely heartening that we are in such a, uh, an intimate cooperation and confident cooperation. For the Paris meeting, I uh, think that uh, uh, we will uh, have an occasion, of course, of uh, exchanging views. I don't want to prejudge. And as you know, I never said in advance myself when I participate to any meeting what uh, would the, the, the meeting will produce. Uh, it is the case when I participate in the G7 meeting or in the G10 or in the G20 or all Gs. There we have an exceptional meeting, which I think is uh, uh, at the level of this uh, exceptionally high level of uncertainty that we are presently experiencing. And I expect that uh, it will overall permit the authorities that will meet to exchange their views in circumstances, again, that are extraordinarily uncertain, to compare notes and to see uh, what, uh, how they could themselves be uh, as enlightened by the conversation with others. Uh, then I would say exactly the same, as I say. Uh, for the question on what we will decide in our next meeting, I would say there will be a press briefing, I'm sure, after the Paris meeting, and we will have a very, very nice way to communicate uh, what we have discussed there. Thank you very much, Mr. Atkins. Hello, Mark James from Reuters. Um, uh, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is that you said you discussed um, a rate cut. W was that only on the basis of 25 basis points or was there a possibility for more? Um, uh, another question is that you talked about um, growth m might recover gradually in 2010. Um, sorry, 2009. Um, is there a possibility that it might not recover and that Europe is now in, in, in you know, is 
possibly kind of experience a, a long uh, recession. And uh, one final question, if I can. Um, w would you, uh, as the ECB, back um, the kind of idea of a, a European-wide fund, a safety net, as it would be, as, uh, that's been floated this week for Europe's banks? First question, I said that uh, two options uh, were uh, uh, there, but I also said that we were unanimous to retain the decision that we have retained. And that, uh, it seems to me, is important to uh, recall. We were unanimous in the present decision. As regards the uh, evolution of growth, Again, I draw your attention to the fact, and you can compare your notes, uh, I told you since a long, long, long period of time, we will have very weak growth, we will have a trough in the second and third quarter, and the risks for growth are on the downside. I said that uh, since a very, very long period. So. We see clearly the materialization today of some of the risks that were clearly in the message, in the diagnosis of the Governing Council. There is, uh, from that uh, standpoint, uh, a great continuity, I have to say, in our analysis. We never hide that we had downside risks to growth after the trough uh, that, uh, that we had in the second and third quarter of this year. Uh, as regards uh, the uh, European Fund, I will – I saw myself a uh, lot of things uh, in the medias. As you see, uh, I reserve communication for after the meeting instead of uh, embarking on uh, a lot of declaration before the meeting. But I would confirm that we are in Europe in a framework which is not a federation, which is not a political federation. We do, do not have a federal budget. And uh, so the idea that we could do the same as what is done on the other side of the Atlantic doesn't fit with the political structure of Europe with the institutional structure of Europe. That being said, I also said a moment ago in responding to a question on a particular uh, bank, I also said that it was very important that in exceptional cases where financial stability